The second half of chapter two looks at measurement. We are all very familiar with measurement, right? We've all made or followed a recipe where we've had to measure out the correct amount of flour, of sugar, of baking soda, or baking powder. And we know if you do not follow that recipe correctly, right, the end product is not going to be as good as it should be or wouldn't taste like it should. Uh, the same is true in chemistry. We need to be able to measure out the reagents we use in a reaction correctly, reproducibly, and in a way that we can communicate that to someone else so that they could reproduce that experiment uh, because they're able to measure in the same way that we are. So we're going to look at how we measure, how we measure co correctly, um, and how we communicate that in science. Uh, the only due dates that you guys have going on right now are Chapter 1, Chapter 2 homework. That will be due on Sunday, 524 um, at 11.59 p.m. And uh, this whole lecture will encompass all of the bullet points. This first video, we're going to talk about measurement in science and scientific notation. The next video, we'll get into accuracy. Uh, and then the last video, we'll deal with significant figures and dimensional analysis. And I really enjoy this lecture because there are many great examples uh, of exemplifying why measurement and why uh, units are very important in life uh, and in science, especially. And so this is just one of those examples. And so 1998, in December of 1998, the Mars Climate Orbiter was launched by NASA. And this was designed to orbit uh, Mars, so be a satellite of Mars, and collect information on the climate, the atmosphere, the surface topography of Mars. Uh, and this was a $330 million program, right? A lot more uh, than I make in a given year. And as you can imagine, there were many PhD level engineers, physicists uh, involved with this program. So many, many, many very educated people involved with this program. And as this orbiter was launched, right, the orbiter was launched into space in December of 99, and it took about 10 months or so for it to reach Mars. And so just imagine those engineers and those physicists just sitting in that control room waiting and waiting and waiting to collect data, right? There's nothing the scientists more than, than collecting and analyzing data. So they were sitting there and waiting and waiting and waiting. And so as that orbiter approached Mars, uh, there needed to be some critical adjustments to the thrusters on that orbiter because number one, if the orbiter was going too fast and was too far from the planet, it wouldn't fall into orbit. It would just simply bounce over the planet and just continue on in the eternity of space. Um, and if it was going too slow and got too close to the planet, the orbiter could get sucked into the planet and crash into the surface of Mars. So both of those outcomes are not good. So there needed to be some key adjustments to the trajectory so that it the orbiter fell into the correct um, alignment with Mars and could orbit Mars properly. And so in September of 1999, some adjustments were made to the trajectory to set it into its final path so that it could become a satellite of Mars and report back all this great information to us. However, there was one problem with this. The one problem was that the input, the engineer that gave the input, gave the input in newtons per second. And that's okay if the program, right, if the thrusters were programmed in newtons per second, However, that wasn't the case. The instrument that controlled the, the thrusters were programmed in non-metric units of foot-pounds per second, right? So the unit in did not equal the unit out. And so as you can imagine, this sent the orbiter on the wrong final trajectory um, with the unfortunate result of the orbiter crashing into the surface of Mars and being completely destroyed. So a $330 million program, right? crashed into the surface of Mars, all because of units, all because the, the correct units were not used um, in this case. And that's with PhD level engineers and physicists working on this project, right? So measurement in science is incredibly important. Units are incredibly important, right? Especially in chemistry, we're measuring temperature, we're measuring changes in a reaction, changes in mass, changes in heat. Um, and measuring moles, as we'll talk about a little bit later. So in chemistry, it's a very quantitative subject. We're measuring many, many different things in a reaction. So 
anytime we're making a measurement, right, we need to indicate what we are measuring. Am I measuring a distance? Am I measuring a mass? Am I measuring energy? Am I measuring, um, you know, heat that's produced or electricity? Am I measuring um, how many molecules are there, right? Or am I measuring the light that's given off from a reaction? So we need to specify what you're measuring. We need the context of that, right? Am I measuring a uh, quantity in volume, right? Am I liquid or a gas? So, and we also need to measure in a uniform way so that if I make a measurement you could go to lab and repeat that measurement. If I ran an experiment and collected data from that experiment, you could go to lab and do the same experiment and collect the same information. You could go to the lab and run the same experiment. All because we're going to be measuring in a uniform way, right? The same is with recipes, right? We need to measure the same amount of flour if we expect the, the recipe to come out with the, the correct To help with this, um, in 1960, the General Conference uh, basically adopted the International System of Units, right? The SI units in the metric system, um, and that's what we're going to use in chemistry. When we talk about length, for example, we're going to talk about meters. When we talk about mass, we're going to talk about grams or kilograms. Um, when we talk about temperature, we're going to talk in Kelvin and Celsius. This is the only one where we're going to have we're going to go back and forth between Kelvin and Celsius. We definitely will not use uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, fortunately, we all have a uniform measurement for time. We're going to talk about that in seconds. And we're going to talk about amount of something with respect to moles, um, as we'll get into a little bit later in the semester. We really won't do much with electric current and luminous intensity, but if we were, the international units for that would be an amp or a candela uh, for both of those. But when we are talking about distance or mass or temperature or time, we will be using these international units. We'll talk about distance in meters and mass in kilograms or grams, temperature in Kelvin, uh, time in seconds, and the amount of something as moles. And for those of you that may be um, international students or maybe from Canada, right, this is very familiar to you, the metric system. And that's the system that we will use when making measurements uh, this semester. It's because the metric system is a decimal system. It's a power 10 system that makes it very, very easy to go between different measurements within the metric system. All because it's based on a prefix system. That prefix tells us where that measurement is with respect to another quantity of that measurement. So in the English system, Right In the English system, we have to remember, okay, there are 12 inches in one foot. And we have to remember that there are, you know, 5,280 uh, feet equals one mile, right? That's the English system. Well, what's better in the metric system, in the metric system, right, if we want to do the same analogy, I have one meter and then in, right, one meter, I would have 100 centimeters, right, where that prefix tells us centi, one one hundredth of that. Uh, I could go the same thing to kilometers, right? I, in one kilometer, I would have 1,000 meters. And I'll break this down in a little bit, but that prefix tells us, okay, kilo meter. I have 1,000 meters. So I don't have to remember how many inches are in a foot, how many feet are in a mile, um, like I do in the English system, because I know the base unit of distance is meter. So if I have a centimeter, well, that's one one hundredth of a meter. If I have a kilometer, I have a thousand meters. So that prefix tells us something about what we're measuring. Right, so like one meter, I would have 10 decimeters, or one meter, I would have 100 centimeters, one meter, I would have 1,000 millimeters, one one millionth of a meter. 
Um, and it goes both directions, right? If I had a thousand meters, that would be one kilometer. So in the metric system, what's great about the metric system is that these prefixes, they tell us the relationship to the base unit. And so we can easily go from kilometers to meters or nanometers or millimeters or centimeters because we know how far away we are from that base unit. So here's our base unit, right? So right here, we'd have our meter. And from that, right, 10 to the 3, that's my kilometer, my kilometer. 10 to the 6, right, would be mega. Um, we're not really going to get beyond that on the larger side, on the smaller side, right? You should definitely expect to know centimeter and millimeter and micrometer, which is 10 to the minus uh, 6, and nanometer, which would be 10 to the minus 9. So though in, within a nanometer, there'd be one, uh, one billionth, one billionth, In one meter, I would have one billion nanometers. Another great thing about the metric system is that it doesn't matter if we're talking about distance or we're talking about mass. Those prefixes are the same. Um, in the English system, there's no correlation between distance in feet and miles, and if I was going to talk about mass in pounds, right? None of those carry over whereas all the prefixes in the metric system carry over, whether I'm talking about something in distance in meters or I'm talking about something in mass in grams. One gram to 1,000 milligrams is the same as one meter to 1,000 millimeters. Those conversions would be the same. And that's what really makes the metric system that much easier to understand and to convert between measurements because we can use those prefixes. So one way just to help relating scale, and some of you may have seen this um, in, in high school, right? Mighty King Henry died unexpectedly drinking chocolate milk. Um, that just helps us get what are the important parts of the metric system that you definitely need to know and how far apart are they. And so here we are at our base unit right here, and how far away are we? Right, so all the way up to mega, which would be 10 to the 6. Kilo is a 10 to the 3 transition. Hecto, deca, we're not going to use those as much, but we definitely will use deci on the smaller side, centi, milli, micro, and then all the way down to nano, which is 1 1 billionth, as I said earlier. So hopefully that helps give you a better understanding of some of the measurements we're going to do and the importance of using the metric system and indicating, you know, what are we measuring, right? Anytime you're answering a question in Chem 106, something you should always ask yourself before you submit your final question is, your final answer is, what units? Do I have the correct units? Because this is chemistry, we're going to be measuring many different things. I want to make sure you're measuring this uh, correctly and you're able to communicate that to someone else so they can also make the same uh, measurement.